Hi, this is Drew Jones of Drew's Guitar Shop in Seattle, Washington, and today I wanted to talk about bridge plate retainers. Um, I'm going to guess that most of you watching this video have uh, never heard of a bridge plate retainer. I'm going to guess that many of you have never heard of a bridge plate. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and explain um, what these things are and the mechanics behind them and uh, why um, it's important to know about. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about guitar anatomy for a second. So what the player sees when they pick up a guitar is they see a bridge sitting on a membrane and that's it. But there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening under here. Let me show you. So first of all, underneath that membrane, you have your X braces. And in between those X braces, you have your bridge. It's actually very important for the guitar's design that the bridge pass those two X braces because the pressure from that bridge um, going down into those braces is actually how sound kind of gets delivered into the rest of the soundboard. So just keep that in mind. Um, it's one of the reasons why X brace guitars sound the way that they do. Underneath that bridge, you have a bridge plate. And that bridge plate will typically span a little bit further than the bridge, maybe a little bit in front of it and will be made out of a material that is harder than the soundboard. Soundboards are usually made out of a soft wood like spruce or some cases uh, uh, Spanish cedar, or sorry, not Spanish cedar, but Western red cedar. Um, Spanish cedar is an entirely different animal. Sometimes see a uh, classical necks back and sides made out of that stuff. Western red cedar is usually a, a, a soundboard material. Um, anyway, um, so this bridge plate sits underneath that soundboard, and uh, this bridge plate is usually made from uh, maple. Sometimes you see it made out of uh, rosewood. Occasionally I've seen it made out of ebony, and sometimes you see it made out of plywood. Kind of depends on the uh, price point of the guitar that you're looking at, uh, possibly like the era of the model of guitar or whatever. Um, but the main point of this bridge plate is that it is supposed to be a hard material because what it's doing is it's... Um, providing a hard surface for your string balls to sit against underneath the bridge and soundboard. So let me go ahead and show you a profile view of what we're looking at with this. So on top, we have our bridge. And underneath that bridge, we have the soundboard, again, made out of a soft wood, something that uh, doesn't really have a lot of resistance to, you know, stuff kind of working its way in um, under pressure. And then underneath that uh, soundboard, you have your bridge plate made out of uh, a hard material, a hardwood. Now, the way that your guitar's bridge works, the way that this whole system works, and I, I'm going to call it a system here because it's, it's doing something. This is active energy that we're talking about. Um, you have a bridge pin that goes down through a hole here, all the way through that bridge, all the way through your soundboard, and all the way through that bridge plate, and your string ball rests here, as the string comes up, breaks away from that bridge pin and goes over the top. Now, what you actually have here is a string ball that's kind of wanting to go this way, string beside, the, beside that bridge pin that's wanting to pull up this way, a string off of the top of that bridge that's wanting to pull this way, and then there's pressure being put from that string down onto that, onto that saddle and into that bridge that's going this way. Now, if there are any engineers in the audience, you know what that is. That's torque. Um, that's a rotational application of force. And that is why it is very, very, very important that all of these parts are intact, glued down well, and working the way that they're supposed to. Um, because what will happen is that if we start applying pressure into this system where pressure doesn't need to be, these parts will all start pulling themselves apart. You got to keep in mind that guitars, acoustic guitars, are very delicate critters. This is a you know one eighth inch thick piece of uh, soft wood. Um, there are little tiny braces in here that are supporting it, but like you got to appreciate how elegantly this is designed to withstand force in a very particular way, and how elegantly these things were glued together and designed in order to take that force safely so that this thing doesn't pull itself apart. There's over 100 pounds of pressure on this thing at any given time if it's tuned up. Would you like put a um, more than 100 pound person standing on your guitar? Because that's kind of the force that we're talking about here. 
Anyway, I just wanted to say that to kind of impress upon you, like the kinds of energies and the kinds of force that we're dealing with and how important it is for all of these parts to be working together. So um, on to the main course here. So a bridge plate is this guy here. And what this bridge plate functions as is a hard surface for the string ball to rest against. Because if this bridge plate weren't here and the string ball were resting against that piece of spruce, very quickly, in no time at all, that pressure would pull that bridge, that uh, string ball through that spruce and your string ball would then be resting on the bottom of that bridge. And rather than having the situation where you have force being applied here to this hard surface and force being applied here to this hard surface, um, and you know that soft surface being kind of sandwiched in between, very comfortably so, you end up with a situation where um, this soft surface has been completely gone through and you now have upward pressure um, being applied only to this, <laughs> only to this hard surface up here. And so you have a situation where you're literally completely relying on a glue joint to hold back all that pressure. So that string ball, you can imagine my two hands here, this hand being the soundboard, this hand being the bridge. And you could imagine, say, uh, this marker being the string ball. Well, if this string ball is wanting to pull this way and it's only glue here, that's where you get this creep where bridges may want to start peeling up. It's why bridges only peel up in the back when you start seeing them peel up, because that's the direction that the force is being applied. And if you have that string ball just resting against that bridge, well, that's going to be something that you're at risk for. Um, and the other thing that's happening here um, tonally is that you are not having this string ball really resting on a, on a hard surface. And so you're going to be losing a little bit of high end. You're going to be losing a little bit of volume. Um, it's probably not going to be something that you notice because it's going to happen. This process is going to happen so slowly that uh, it's just going to kind of gradually change over the course of months, years, you know, whenever. But at the end of the day, what you end up with, if this bridge plate is worn through and the soundboard is worn through, is this situation here, which is not good. Now, bridge plates are made out of a harder material, but they do have a tendency to wear out. Like I said, this is a system with active force being applied to it. And so what will happen eventually is that, you know, it's a, it's a metal ball. It's hard, and it's sitting against a hard but much softer than metal piece of wood. And so the string ball will eventually kind of travel up through that bridge plate, and you'll end up with a situation, you know, where the string ball is sitting somewhere up in there. And that's the kind of thing that a bridge plate retainer is designed to correct. So let me go ahead and draw another illustration here so that we can really clearly kind of understand what's going on with a bridge plate retainer. So there's our bridge, there's our soundboard, there's our bridge plate. And we're gonna assume that um, there's kind of a hollow that's been made here in front of the bridge pin. And so while the bridge pin goes through and it goes through in its normal hole in the top and you can't really see all this wear in the bottom, there's still this void down here and the string ball is wanting to sit against here. So what we do is we install a little strip of wood. So this little strip of wood is something about this size, maybe a little smaller. And it's just, an, you know, usually like an eighth inch, sometimes you know, some other measurement, 330 seconds or whatever, piece of, piece of hardwood. Um, I like to use rosewood for this procedure. Some people use maple. Um, I suppose you could use other materials as well. Um, but those are kind of the two common ones. I prefer using rosewood because I think it's harder and it's, um, you know, pretty easy for me to get. And uh, it's just kind of habit at this point. It smells nice too, by the way. Um, what we'll do is we'll glue this piece of... Uh, glue this piece of wood underneath the bridge plate. And what we'll do is through the top here where the pin goes in through that pinhole, after this has been glued and it seals off that bottom, we'll dribble some stuff in here. So um, imagine this being open. We'll dribble a little bit of epoxy and that epoxy kind of flows down and fills in this hole and uh, backs up that uh, bridge plate retainer with some actual solid material um, and fills that void. And so what we do then is we'll go ahead and we'll re-drill that hole where the bridge pin is supposed to fit and then we'll ream that hole to the appropriate angle of the pin. 
And once that's done, you have a string ball that's resting comfortably against another hard surface that's backed by, you know, some good solid material. And so you have that system backed in, back intact where you have the appropriate application to force from that string ball, from the string, from the string, to the saddle. And you don't have the situation where this bridge is taking all that force and kind of wanting to pull up. And uh, you don't have the situation where if that torque gets bad enough that your X braces will start kind of wanting to peel loose and other things will start to happen like cracks and uh, various other structural problems. Uh, because if this um, is a thing that's kind of left to fester, uh, what happens is that over time, that, that weird application of force to this very delicate system is going to cause certain parts of it to start breaking down earlier. Um, you could sort of think of this as, um, you know, standard maintenance. Um, you know, if you don't change your tires on your car frequently enough, like you're going to have alignment issues would be like kind of a, a good example of this. Like, so, you know, getting your tires changed and stuff is, is a much healthier thing to do for your vehicle in the long run um, than to allow those things to kind of fester and cause further problems for more expensive parts down the line. Um, because at the end, if, if your bridge starts peeling up and then you have to have the bridge plate retainer, well, now this is a $40 procedure, this is like a $70 procedure, and if you've got cracks developing and, bridge, and, and braces coming loose, like you're getting into the hundreds of dollars. Uh, versus something that just could be 40 bucks when you go in, because that's what I charge for putting in a bridge plate retainer. Um, now, some of you may be thinking, well, you're adding material. Is it going to change the tone? Yeah, possibly. Um, you might be able to hear a difference. Um, I would argue that the difference that you're probably going to hear is going to be a good one, um, because now you have more pressure that's being applied in the appropriate spot and to a hard surface like it's supposed to be. Um, I think that you're going to notice probably a little bit more volume, and I think that you're probably going to notice um, probably your high end coming back. Um, and I think that both of those things are, are good, actually. Um, there is a little bit of material being added in, so it's not going to sound like the guitar did when it was brand new. Um, but the nice thing about this repair is that this is a very cheap thing to do um, versus, you know, the more expensive stuff that will come down the line. Now, you could... Um, and you will have to eventually, because this bridge plate retainer will also, like all parts down here, will all start to wear out, um, go in and pull the bridge plate. And uh, the question might be being asked now, why don't you just replace the bridge plate wholesale? Well, there are reasons um, that you'd want to opt for this instead. Um, the main reason is because pulling the bridge plate out of a guitar is a much more involved, much more risky, and much more expensive procedure. I've got to go in there with this curved, specialized knife and apply heat to this area underneath the soundboard and then go in and peel this bridge plate off. And uh, then I've got to clean up this area underneath the bridge, like kind of blind. Um, there's techniques that I use for this that I'm not going to talk about in this video because it'd be too involved. Um, but this is a much longer procedure and time is money. And so this procedure here would probably be more like a $150 repair versus a $40 repair. So, you know, not saying that you shouldn't opt for having the bridge plate, um, you know, just replaced wholesale, um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, considering, it's definitely a considerable amount of difference in cost. Um, and uh, to be honest, I don't think that the, the difference in tone is going to warrant it. Um, if this bridge plate retainer went in there and it drastically changed things for the worse, I would maybe be saying something different, but I've been doing this for a long, long time. And I'll say that every time I've done one of these, the guitar has always come out sounding way better. So what you will notice is that the guitar playing as it is now will not sound as good as after the bridge plate is in, the bridge plate retainer is installed. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, um, I hope that, um, that that kind of makes sense of things. Um, as far as like the functionality there. Um, other cases in which you may want to install a bridge plate retainer, um, and I'm just going to kind of throw this out there as a suggestion possibly for some folks, um, you will kind of see some half wear through a, bri through a uh, bridge plate sometimes. So imagine this is your uh, bridge plate here. Sometimes you'll see a string ball that's kind of eaten its way about halfway through. And um, though that's not necessarily like, you know, super bad yet, like that's, that's still a territory where you've still got that hard surface. It's, it's, not, it's not a deal breaker. Um, if you're going to do a procedure, say like uh, you're going to go in and get some bone bridge pins installed um, 
or you're going to have some serious work done on the bridge um, that's going to necessitate the possible redrilling or um, re-reaming of these bridge plate of these uh, bridge pin holes. Uh, it may be a good idea at that moment to take the opportunity to just kind of preemptively install that bridge plate retainer. And um, the reason that I say that is just because this procedure, installing this thing, is going to have to involve drilling and reaming anyway. And so it may just behoove you to go ahead and install that bridge plate right then, or bridge plate retainer right then, um, while you're doing that other work, and uh, just not wait for that part to kind of finally fail since it's already kind of on its way out. That's just my two cents as, as you know, somebody has been doing this for a while. Um, that's down to kind of personal preference. I think I wouldn't try to talk somebody into it um, necessarily. I would suggest it, but I wouldn't like, I wouldn't say like you need to do this right now. Um, and other than that, I think that we've pretty well covered this topic. Um, if you can think of any questions that you have for me, go ahead and leave them in the comments. Or uh, uh, if you have any long-form questions, that is to say something that's like a paragraph or longer, um, feel free to drop me uh, you know, uh, a, a tip in my Kofi and, and send the message uh, through there because those messages do tend to take a long time to uh, answer. And I love answering questions for people, but the, the, it does take time. And this is a one-person shop, and so I already suffer from the issue of, of kind of doing a lot of unpaid labor here. Um, so I also have a link down there to my uh, Patreon, and if you uh, want to support my videos, um, that's a really good place to do it. You can do that for like a dollar a month. Um, and uh, I also have a link down there to my uh, my uh, Reverb page where I sell some instruments uh, and to my website where you can find a page on uh, caring for stringed instruments, which um, you know you may find helpful if you are a, a player of stringed instruments. Um, there's tips on there about like humidity and cleaning and care, standard stuff um, that you know most musicians I think should know. Um, and uh, I also have a lot more videos like this on my channel. So if you found this one helpful and uh, you think you have some friends who uh, might uh, enjoy this video or others that I have made, uh, please feel free to link them to my channel. Um, this channel is growing um, a lot in this last year, and uh, I'm uh, really happy that uh, all you new followers have uh, decided to join me here. Uh, so, you know, um, I appreciate you all. Anyway, this has been Drew Jones of Drew's Guitar Shop in Seattle, Washington. Thanks for watching.